हार्डी वाइनबर्ग प्रिंसिपल और हार्डी वाइनबर्ग कैसल प्रिंसिपल अल्टरनेटिवली रेफर टू एस हार्डी वाइनबर्ग लो और हार्डी वाइनबर्ग इक्विलिब्रियम वट इज दिस प्रिंसिपल इट्स रियली एन इंपॉर्टेंट कंसेप्ट इन एवल्यूशन बायोलॉजी एंड ऑल्सो पॉपुलेशन जेनेटिक्स राइट सो इट्स इंट्रोड्यूस्ड बाय यू नो सो इट्स बेसिकली यू कैन ट्रेस बैक द हिस्ट्री ऑफ दिस टू द कैसल कैसल वॉज एन अमेरिकन जेनेटिस्ट William Cassel way back in 1903 but uh, somehow his name is kind of avoided in all the discussions of this Hardy Weinberg everyone talks about Hardy Weinberg alone and Hardy was a English mathematician right his his full name is Godfrey uh, you know uh, Harold Hardy right uh, as well as the the German genet uh, the gynecologist uh, the German gynecologist is from Stuttgart is from uh, his name is Uh, Willem Weinberg. So they both uh, independently conceived it in 1908. But now nowadays we know that this is actually predates it. It's by the Cassel. So it is. What is this all about? This is like a null hypothesis of evolutionary biology. So if the evolution, you know, all these mechanisms like uh, I was telling you about selection, drift, migration, uh, assortative mating, all those things are uh, if it's not happening. that means that the driving force of the evolution doesn't happen then what how the genotypes will fluctuate in the population the gene pool genotype so that is what so it's actually very very simple you know so that it's it's nothing into you know nothing complicated about this principle it's really very basic mathematics but somehow this the cross talk between biologists and uh, you know this uh, uh, mathematicians have been classically missing right so that is why it's very interesting the, if you look at the history of this uh, you know so basically it, it connects allele frequency to the genotype frequency that is the fundamental uh, principle of this hardy weinberg equilibrium so let's first uh, uh, discuss what it is all about it's really simple let p be the frequency of a allele a as you know it is basically dominant allele right a is dominant while small a is recessive right and q is the frequency of a uh, small a the recessive allele or allele 1 or allele 2 you know so there is an, a, another way to say it's allele 1 or 2 which is little bit more accurate because that accommodate uh, you know so uh, co dominant variant right there if there is no recessive then this is much better way to say allele 1 and allele 2 it doesn't matter if there are only two versions of the gene which is how the usual case in deployed organisms like a human being or most of the sexually reproducing organisms are all deployed isn't it so in that case the only two variants of the uh, genes that is the two versions of the same gene is called allele right so p plus q is always one so let us let us say p is uh, you know p p and q are nothing but allele frequency so if the frequency of p is uh, let us say 30 percentage then anyone can say it's q should be 70 because together it makes 100 percentage or in probability it is 1 uh, you know if it is 0.3 then other one should be 0.7 this is 1 minus 0.3 isn't it i hope it's clear to you so then how about the genotype so it's basically p plus q whole square that is what because it is deployed organism so it is a, the the formula is really simple it's like a plus b whole square is equal to a square plus 2ab plus b square which we learned in basic algebra in school days so the same thing here also p plus q whole square is equal to p square plus 2pq plus q square which is 1 that is what this rule is the the hardy weinberg principle is that uh, you know this genotype frequency if you combine all the genotype frequency will be equal to 1 and the principle the second part of the principle is that this genotype frequency is static it doesn't change generations after generation it would be exactly same given there are no violations to the assumptions so there are few key assumptions to uh, this hardy weinberg principle the assumption is actually very simple that there is no mechanisms happening uh, evolutionary mechanisms are you know natural selection drift and migration these three are really really important isn't it mutation and assortative mating all these are uh, the you know the mechanisms where organic evolution happens so if nothing of this sort happens then the genotype frequency remains static throughout 
the the generations you know so that is what uh, this principle is all about so genotype frequencies can be calculated from the allele frequencies so this is basically an idealized population which doesn't evolve so if there is an evolution you need to factor in the factors responsible for the evolution to happen isn't it so if there is no such things happening none of this mechanisms work then it remains static you know so in population following the mendelian genetics allele frequencies do not change so it remain constant from one generation to another that is what the principle is about right remember that the evolution is defined as change in allele frequencies of a population over generations over time so that means that uh, yeah, this is like a null hypothesis the evolution is not happening that is why the frequencies are not changing so if you look at the history of this principle it's basically by the Eule uh, and Pearson you know so they said that uh, I mean they conceived it uh, very long back it predates even the castle uh, you know so what the, the mistake which they made is that P should be equal to Q which is should be equal to 0.5 that is 50 percentage of the genotype should be P and 50 percent of genotype should be Q then only the equilibrium can be achieved as per Eule you know and then Eule presented uh, to the the Pearson Pearson also agreed uh, that it, it should be equal and it should be equal to 0.5 percentage P and Q should be 0.5 but then when they came to know about the Punnett came to know about this matter Punnett the same geneticist system behind the Punnett square Punnett is kind of confused it should it be really 0.5 how about the, some other uh, you know uh, uh, in apart from 0.5 so then he was playing a cricket match you know it is in Britain so they were playing a match of cricket and uh, uh, you know so his friend was Hardy Hardy is a hardcore mathematician you know so he played and then I um, mean he discussed casually with the Hardy and then Hardy said oh well this is very simple uh, you know uh, algebra let me solve it immediately then he solved it and he submitted his uh, letter to the editor of science so that is why uh, what this is now renowned as uh, hardy weinberg so this cross talk is really important that is what this principle is all about mathematics and biology so frequencies will remain constant in the population from generation to generation until it is disturbed by any of these mechanisms including selection or drift or other mechanisms you know so uh, that is exactly the the principle is all about you know so it will it can be calculated so the the genotype frequencies can be calculated from the allele frequencies and vice versa there is a utility of the hardy weinberg principle you know so and what are the assumptions of this equilibrium so uh, i already told you but this assumption include selection mutation migration and drift and this assortative mating these are the uh, assumption there is no selection happening and the mating is completely random there is no assortative mating happening there is no migration you know the movement of uh, two population the individuals of two population is known as migration and there is no chance even like drift you know then only that any of this assumption when it get invalidated you know then what will happen is that uh, you know this uh, the evolution doesn't happen you know so that is what uh, I mean the, the equilibrium get violated so uh, the total is no more one you know so that is what the the, uh, the, the allele frequencies right so the, the first four assumptions are a lot more important than the fifth one the fifth one is about random mating uh, you know in uh, uh, you know so it, if you are uh, saying like ran, does the random mating change the allele frequencies in the whole population you know it doesn't but random mating the uh, uh, i mean not random a uh, non-random mating what will happen is that uh, some individual prefer to mate only with the preferred mate having certain phenotype so in that case then of course after generations and generation it can split lineage split can happen you know so that is uh, that is the reason for uh, random mating the you know is also an important assumption if the the mating is random then that kind of split doesn't happen right so yes yeah, so you know so uh, uh, yeah uh, random mating in strict sense sense so strict right in strict sense random mating doesn't uh, change 
the equilibrium okay but still it's really important and now coming to first four uh, clauses or assumptions the second one is again that's very weak mutation so, you know so mutation is very weak but it's important because it provides uh, the genetic variation the variations are the raw materials for the selection to happen you know so that is why uh, number two is also really important okay now let us consider one by one first is selection we already discussed about the natural selection different forms of natural selection right so selection can be classically be defined as the difference between the survival or fecundity of the individual with certain phenotypes or variation compared with other phenotype so there is a differential advantage for certain variation and why these variations have advantage because it increases the fitness and what does that mean so because these are variations are adaptive they can survive to reproduce better by making use of the local environmental niche you know so that is what the natural selection is about right so it's a differential survival and reproduction of fit variants because they are adapted to the environment that is what the natural selection is about i hope it's clear next is drift uh, as i told you drift is really important and nowadays we know that after uh, sequencing and all whole genome uh, analysis it became really clear that drift plays a substantial role in evolution so the most prominent uh, you know mode of uh, shaping the evolution and shaping the genome neutral theory of molecular evolution by moto kimura is also in support of the drift rather than the selection selection is very rare but it's important for you know non synonymous mutations arise by the selection you know adaptive uh, evolution is by the natural selection a drift is the most prominent mechanism which is completely avoided in uh, most of the evolutionary biologists because the evolutionary biologists are still thinking in uh, you know uh, thinking of darwin as the god <laughs> that is incorrect way right of course uh, we have many other uh, influential evolutionary biologists for example stephen jay gold so gold was not exactly a darwinist but his theory is a lot more prominent in uh, the paleontology you know so that also in, in support of the drift right now uh, yes yeah, so the drift uh, can you know of course the drift can happen at many levels from you know you can even start from the sperms right from millions of sperm in one ejaculation which sperm of course each sperm will have slightly different genotype and which one is going to penetrate the ovum to make the zygote so again that's a chance event right it's completely chance event right the drift and of course it can happen at the individual level or population level right it's completely chance right so change in frequencies of the alleles in population due to sampling error that is chance or luck you know so that is what that the drift is so it results in non adaptive evolution and drift can result in uh, sometime uh, you know the uh, in increase in frequency of certain lethal uh, you know uh, non essential and lethal rather uh, genes so that is the problem with the drift but yes so drift is completely random mathematical phenomenon you know one example would be like an asteroid is impacting or you can think of like nuclear holocaust you know so if there is a nuclear uh, uh, you know uh, war happening and the entire world disappears you know it becomes completely nuclear and it just happened that only few individuals were inside the lab you know with the lead uh, the lead room so it all depends the next generation of human being it depends who happened to be at that particular time inside that lead room you know so that the genotype will be determined so that is a, a population bottleneck it's completely chance that they just happened to be at that time inside that lead room inside the lab lab where they are working you know drift fine so that is completely non adaptive evolution isn't it so uh, yes yeah, so deleterious recessive scan become selected uh, you know the frequencies can increase through the drift so there is a that's a big problem with this uh, drift but of course it's positive and negative isn't it so the drift is completely natural and random you know but natural selection of course the variation is random but uh, the survival of the variant certain variant is non random 
that is the difference between the drift and selection the main main difference right and remember the Moto Kimura's neutral theory drift is the most important mechanism of evolution at the level of DNA sequences you know and now coming to the third one is about assortative mating assortative like assorted cookies means uh, you know the mating is not random simple example is caste system and majority of the marriages happens in in the caste system almost 99% of marriages happen inside the same caste and if this happens if this trend goes on for uh, thousands upon thousands of generation then genotypes start diverging that is what the race is all about isn't it so that kind of mating is assortative mating there is some uh, phenotype like in the nature, of course, there is no uh, concept, the ideology doesn't exist, right? The concept of religion doesn't exist. Over there, it is about the, the phenotype. For example, bird plumage or beak size. So, you know, male, uh, uh, similar kind of male, uh, I mean, the long beaked finch prefer to mate with long beaked, uh, you know, female finch. So in that case, there is an assortative mating is happening. So uh, there is a non-random mating. Random mating is basically disassortative mating, right? Completely random. So individuals tend to mate with others with similar genotype or phenotype. You know, that is going to be, uh, you know, a driving force for the speciation if this continues, isn't it? So the antonym of this assortative mating is disassortative mating, which is completely random. So it can increase in the frequency of deleterious recessive leading to the decrease in the fitness. So that is what you call it as inbreeding depression, right? The, if you happen to breed with the individuals, uh, you know, uh, individuals of, for example, your uh, relative, right? If, if it happens, a marriage happens between the relative, then this is going to be a problem, right? That the closely related individuals mate then that will lead to the expression of the recessive allele you know so this kind of recessives are usually deleterious so that is a problem with this assortative mating of course if you uh, this kind of inbreeding is a, 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 an example of assortative mating if it's disassortative it's completely random uh, then the problems are not not much so biologically speaking uh, you know offsprings of disassortative matings are a lot more fit you know, so there is another cross talk to the immunology. There is something called major histocompatibility complex, MHC. So we tend to mate with, so, you know, people with different MHC. So a male with certain MHC, if that male finds a partner who is having a completely different MHC, then the offspring is going to inherit both this MHC major histocompatibility complex and what does that translate to the offspring is immune to both of these whatever the disease that these MHCs render protection to so it's in one sense it's always better to find a partner which is completely different uh, the ideal scenario would be from India get married to someone from Brazil the polar opposite right if you drill a hole from India it will open up I mean, it's just uh, imagination, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so if the partner is completely different, you know, of course, the MHC complex will be different. And biologically speaking, it's really fit, you know. So that is what you call it as disassortative mating. But assortative mating is just the opposite. And the extreme example of the assortative mating is marrying inside your family, you know, the, the relative, close relative marriage. Uh, I'm from Kerala and of course in even in Kerala certain caste do have this uh, you know even my own caste of course early on uh, uh, the, the caste that I, I am belong to so like the uncle's daughter in Malayalam we call it as Murappin you know so that kind of system was at once upon a time was common even today you can see that certain uh, uh, families do practice it which is very bad biologically speaking. And now finally migration, what is that? Migration is the movement of alleles from one population to another. How this, it's like if you go to the airport, if you ever travel abroad, you need to fast before the, the security check. There is a passport control where 
the migration officers. The immigration officers will look your passport to verify there is a visa, right? So that is what migration or migratory bird, right? They are migrating from one location to another. This is a movement of alleles from one population to another or one gene pool. It's like a mix of all genes of a population. You can think of a bucket, virtual bucket where you put all the genes. That is called gene pool, you know. One population to another the migration. So migration can be two. Depends on where you are talking from. For example, from here, you are going to Brazil. Then it is called what? Immigration. From Indian's point of view, it is immigration. And when you reach, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Brazil, uh, what will happen? Rio airport, you are entering. Then the immigration, you are going to the immigration control, isn't it? That is, for them, it is immigration, that is incoming, right? So, Immigration means incoming while immigration is outgoing. So out of these two things, immigration have more profound impact because people who are coming in can find their mate and they can actually fertilize and they can um, make the offspring. So that lead to hybridization, the intermixing of the gene pool, which is biologically speaking very good. MHC, remember, if the, the two things are completely different genotype, then uh, two different kinds of MHCs are getting intermixed into the offspring. So much better than assortative mating, mating between closely related, uh, like for example, if you are from one state, Kerala for example, and getting married to another Kerala, Malayali to Malayali, rather Malayali to Punjabi is so much better fit, you know, because it's completely different, the culture is different. MHCs are different too, you know. So that is what biologically speaking, right? And now this is a very interesting uh, simulation. Uh, I saw that across in one of this uh, book. This is a book which I take, right? This book is, uh, is called Evolutionary Analysis by uh, John C. Heron and Scott Freeman. Very nice book. I really love this book a lot. And this book, this is picked up from this book. This is, it's a game, okay? So it's zygote making game. So all these are nothing but ovum and sperm. So what all you have to do is close your eyes and randomly touch any of these locations. You can take a printout, which I suggest you and randomly touch any location after closing your hand, uh, of course, closing your eyes, then pick up that zygote, I mean, sperm or ovum. Let it be a sperm, uh, A, capital A, and now another uh, uh, you know, uh, ovum, it has to be second touch has to be ovum somewhere near whatever the ovum you are getting in the proximity, then you combine together to make zygote. I hope it's clear. First touch, if it's ovum, then the next step, you have to take another, uh, you know, uh, not another ovum, but it has to be sperm. So basically sperm and ovum, you need to mix to make a zygote. So if you do the same experiment 100 times, that means you are creating 100 zygotes completely random from this. How much are you going to get? You know, so basically this particular figure is, uh, this image is made in such a way that 60% are capital A alleles, while 40% are small A alleles. Let it be sperm or ovum, it doesn't matter. Small A, for example, this one is a small A uh, ovum while this is small a sperm so if you count it everything together capital a will be around 60 percentage not around exactly 60 and small a will be uh, exactly 40 percentage okay so this is the the genotype of the starting population now you're picking randomly that is what uh, i asked you to close your uh, you know the uh, the eyes and randomly picking so it is kind of drift chance even luck plays role here isn't it and now if you make it this game for 100 times so it's a simulation isn't it if you do it for 100 times uh the uh, you know so uh, let us say uh you're you're doing it 100 times so then what will happen is that at the starting the frequency is what 0.4 and 0.6 now if you take up a uh, 100 times let us say 34 times you got a a you know, double dominant. Now, this is heterozygous A and small a 57 times you got 
and then small a small a you got nine times a a you got 34 times 57 times you got a and small a capital a small a heterozygotes then recessive homozygote you got nine times so if you count to total is going to be 100 so that is a frequency of uh, you know after selecting you know this sperm is completely random that is there is a drift element in here before starting it was 60 40 okay so i got uh, did the first step of this drift here and then let us imagine that these 34 individuals this is i got individual develop into 34 adults and each adult supplies 10 times gamete you know so 34 adults together make 340 gametes let it be sperm or ova it doesn't matter so 340 gametes are being produced 10 times you know each, each individual is making 10 gametes and all are fertile now let us say out of 340 gametes how many will be a and how many will be small a all 340 are going to be capital a because it is this genotype this individual have all 34 individual have a a capital a capital a genotype so all 340 will be having uh, you know capital a genotype none will be having small a genotype in the gamete i hope it's clear now let us uh, shift our attention to this heterozygote capital a small a 57 individuals have this genotype heterozygous and 57 individuals Together they make 570 gametes. 10 times. It's the same thing. Out of 570, half will be having uh, capital A. Another half will be having small a. I hope it's clear. 285 will be capital A. 285 will be small a. Now coming to the final. Uh, you know, so it's a uh, homozygous, homozygous recessive. So a a small a small a there are only nine individuals very very few and this together these nine individuals will make 90 gametes gametes okay including both sperm and ovum and out of this 90 gametes none will be having capital a dominant pheno, uh, genotype while every 90 will be having small a in the gamete I hope it's clear now if you calculate the total 625 will be capital a 375 will be small a now the frequency because the total is thousand so uh, you know so 625 divided by the total that is thousand is equal to 0 0.625 and 375 the small a divided by thousand is equal to 0 0.375 now immediately it's become apparent frequencies have changed you know the allele frequency is changed from first generation at the filial at the start the frequency of the dominant allele that is capital a had been 0 0.600 exactly 6 now the capital a the frequency is little bit more 0 0.625 see so now at the filial number 0 that is the first generation uh, the small a recessive allele frequency had been 40 percentage or 0 0.400 now after the first generation the second filial the frequency has changed little bit less now 0 0.375 see the change of allele frequency in a population over generation or over time is called molecular evolution now you can see that the, the evolution has happened because of drift you know i hope it's clear so that is what this drift or chance events uh, can substantially change you know uh, the the mode of evolution you know and we can do this similar thing in the probability tree also if you have taken my course on uh, mathematical biology we have already introduced this probability tree it's a very intuitive way uh, to actually see that how uh, the probability changes you know so let us say uh, offspring of a heterogeneous parents with one dominant allele and one recessive allele capital a and small a right so what is the probability of an offspring having at least one recessive gene at least one recessive gene means any of the offspring having small a what is the probability or what is the probability having an offspring with recessive phenotype to get recessive phenotype you need 
double recessive that is small a small a then only you are going to get the recessive phenotype isn't it so how do you do that so it's really simple so this is how the tree looks like contribution with the the female gamete is a first and then here it is a male gamete contribution to the, the male gamete is the second one so basically you are starting from here first is capital f or small f the second could be uh, capital m and small m you are actually adding on the, the male gamete because of fertilization is happening to get the genotype f capital f capital m then capital f small m then small f capital m and finally small f small m it's just like the earlier example which we said capital a capital a capital a small a so these are heterozygotes isn't it and small a small a is this right so now saying that this is what at least one recessive gene is all these three are at least one recessive gene right and recessive phenotype is only this this is the uh, the, the phenotype you know so you just need to multiply these to get this probability whatever the probability of this multiplied by the probability of this to get the total probability of this uh, you know line that is the probability tree is all about uh, you know let us consider x and y is 0.5 so if it's 0 0.5 0 0.5 so the frequency of this x square is going to be 0 0.5 multiplied with 0 0.5 so it is basically 0 0.25 isn't it so that is uh, what the uh, uh, this one is the, the frequency is the final frequency is you can calculate by multiplying and if you want to combine this together then you just need to take a plus so this probability plus this probability plus this probability is going to be what so if you know only one of these like x or y if you know you can calculate the other it is just one minus that y if you know only y you want to calculate x it is one minus y is equal to x or 1 minus x is equal to y so that way you can actually calculate everything because as per hardy weinberg it is x square plus 2x y plus y square is equal to 1 so it's actually very simple and finally looking at the phenotype first three is going to have the the dominant phenotype while the last one is going to have recessive phenotype now let us consider uh, one example suppose that a given site genes uh, you know gene site is not sex linked right and has two alleles of which one is recessive for percentage of the randomly interbreeding population shows recessive phenotype so the recessive phenotype is four percentage okay what is the probability that the individual in the population with the dominant phenotype is heterozygous the question is that you we need to look at the uh, uh, heterozygous individual of course the heterozygous is always dominant phenotype it's not required this information is extra right so how much is heterozygous that is what we have to calculate given that four percentage is recessive phenotype so phenotype means immediately you should know that this is the our recessive phenotype which is four percentage as per this uh, this particular problem so if it is four percentage you know y square this one is basically four percent uh, you know 0 0.4 right if you convert the percentage into the uh, you know probability it is basically 0 0.4 here so it is basically you can actually calculate this one is going to be y square is, is going to be 0 0.04 actually not 4 right 0 0.04 four percentage in probability is basically 0 0.04 right uh, yes, so uh, then it is uh, there is a wrong here. It's basically 0 0.04 y square is 0 0.04 then y is root of 0 0.04 is 0.2 I hope it's clear. So we already calculated y which is 0 0.2 then what is x 1 minus y is x 0.8 So this is wherever y is there you can substitute that with 0.2 and wherever x is there you can substitute that with 0.8 then you can calculate the probability of this genotype it is basically uh, here it is 0 0.8 then this is 0 0.8 the, then it is you uh, multiply 0 0.8 with 0 0.8 it is going to be 0 0.64 right this then 0 0.8 multiplied with 0 0.2 0 0.16 like that you, you can calculate all these things uh, to get that answers you know so that is how to calculate this probability right so basically we have to calculate 0 0.16 plus 0 0.16 is going to be 0 0.32 right 32 percentage is going to have uh, the heterozygous 
genotype. Both of these are homozygous, while these are heterozygous. Post heterozygous is going to be having dominant phenotype. So no problem about it. So you have to calculate this probability and you need to combine that. You need to sum it with this probability. That is 0.16 plus 0.16 is 0.32. Please do calculation yourself so that you can follow what I'm saying. And here are some of the homework for you. So let me read out. If 91% of the population shows dominant phenotype, what is the probability of having homozygous individual showing dominant phenotype? Let me help you to solve this problem. Let me go back here. 91% of population shows dominant phenotype. If you go back one slide, this is dominant phenotype. So if you combine this plus this plus this is equal to 91%, right? Then what is the probability of having a homozygous showing dominant phenotype? So you have to calculate a homozygous dominant phenotype. That means only this you have to calculate. So given the first sentence is 91 shows dominant phenotype. That means this plus this plus this is 91. Then immediately you can calculate this. 100 minus 91 is 9. So this is basically 9 percentage or 0 0.09. Then you can calculate y. This is basically uh, 3, isn't it? 0.3 is going to be the, uh, the y. x is going to be 1 minus 0.3 that is 0.7. Then this is going to be 7 multiplied by 7 is 49, that is 0.49. See, you can do that work. It's actually very simple. Second problem is 49% of the population have dominant individuals with homozygous genotype. What is the probability of having recessive phenotype? So dominant individuals with homozygous. So these are, uh, these are heterozygous. This is homozygous. This is 49%. Now the question is that Recessive phenotype is always this. You have to calculate this. Okay, this you need to calculate. And finally, 16% of the population have recessive phenotype. What is the probability of having a heterozygous individual? So recessive phenotype is 16%. This is 16%. Now you need to calculate probability of having a heterozygous individual. That means this two, this plus this you need to calculate. I hope you can do this work.